Oh, good morning, everyone. It is great to be here with you today um, and share some things that I have been thinking about for the last few months. So every couple of years or so, I teach a course on the novels of Jane Austen. We begin, yeah, she can get a shout out, that's fine. Um, we begin the semester with Pride and Prejudice, a novel that my students are generally familiar with, and I'm guessing many of you are as well. Um, even if you haven't read the novel, um, you may have seen one of several film versions or even um, been to a stage adaptation, like the one Arena Theater uh, did last year. Yes. Pride and Prejudice is one of those novels that has seeped into our popular culture. Um, and one of the main reasons is its heroine, Elizabeth Bennet. Um, she regularly makes the list in polls of favorite literary characters. She is witty and feisty. She's never afraid to state her opinion, and when she does, her words are always perfectly expressed. She is, in fact, the person that many of us would like to be, the one who's always ready with a confident, witty response to anything that comes her way. After spending a few weeks with Pride and Prejudice, my students are usually shocked when we shift to the second novel, Mansfield Park. The heroine in this novel is nothing like Elizabeth Bennet. Instead, Fanny Price is quiet and shy, hesitant to express her opinion even when she's asked. She may be sweet and caring, but many, and sometimes most, of my students find her boring. They would like her much better if she asserted herself and stood up for her rights. Essentially, they would like her much better if she were Elizabeth Bennet. Interestingly, this response is not an anomaly. Literary scholars have also had a difficult time with Fanny Price. In fact, a well-known mid-20th century scholar named Lionel Trilling famously said, nobody has ever found it possible to like the heroine of Mansfield Park. <laughs> now, here is what is particularly interesting to me about this dislike of Fanny Price. Trilling, I think rightly, locates much of this dislike in the moral vision of the novel, arguing that it scandalizes modern assumptions about social relations, about virtue, about religion, sex, and art. Fanny, you see, this quiet, humble, and occasionally boring heroine is the moral center of the novel. She is the one who holds firm to her Christian values, while the more interesting, vibrant characters with their more modern assumptions about pleasure and desire spiral into self-destruction. It makes sense, then, that secular literary scholars would be frustrated with this vision, since Fanny's Christian framework isn't one that they share. But what about us? Why is it that many Christian readers also have such a difficult time admiring or even liking Fanny? Well, one reason might be the fact that Fanny's humility isn't based simply on her love for God. She has, in fact, been compelled to be humble. As a child living in poverty, she was adopted by her rich relatives. But rather than treating her as one of their own children, they instead ensured that Fanny would always know that she was inferior to her rich cousins. Her humility wasn't chosen. Rather, it was imposed upon her. And while she was growing up, it made her vulnerable to neglect and even abuse by her rich relatives. In certain respects, it even damaged her self-worth and made it difficult for her to speak out against evil when she should have. Fanny may be the moral center of this novel, but most of us don't want to be her. She seems to illustrate much of what makes us uncomfortable about the virtue of humility. The fact that it places us in a vulnerable position and opens us up to the danger that we may be taken advantage of. And the reality is, if we look back at history or look around at the world today, we find many examples of people who have been exploited by others in the name of humility. And if we're honest, we have to admit that sometimes it's been Christians who have exhorted others to be humble while they themselves continue to live comfortably in their own prideful state. For many women, as well as for many racial and ethnic minorities, the virtue of humility is often wrapped up in a long, troubling history of oppression. So then, as Christians, what do we do with Philippians 2, 1 through 11? A passage that not only exhorts us to be humble, but holds up Christ's death on the cross as our ultimate example. 
This morning, I would like to dive into this challenging topic by looking closely at the virtue of humility, the virtue of humility that this passage calls us to, a humility that, as we will see, is not a result of oppression or low self-esteem. It is not a humility that robs us of our agency and makes us unable to act. Instead, the humility that we find in this passage is humility with a purpose. In this passage, we are exhorted to practice mutual humility within community, which leads then to the unity that is necessary for the spread of the gospel. As we will see, this is a type of humility that first has its foundation in God's love for us and our worth as his creation. Second, is enacted through love within community. And finally, results in effective ministry. Let's start by looking at the challenge we are presented with in this passage. In Philippians 2.5, we are confronted with a seemingly impossible task. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul challenges the Philippians and us to have the same mind as Christ in his humility. And as Paul unpacks that idea, the true extent of that humility is frankly beyond what our limited human minds can comprehend. For Christ Jesus made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. What was it like for our infinite, omnipotent, omniscient savior to take on human flesh? This is a type of humility that we can never experience but it doesn't stop there. Because Christ, on top of that, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Our perfect savior suffered a humiliating death on the cross, not because of something he did wrong, but for us and our sins. Now, as we think of Christ's death, we may prefer to focus on the idea of our powerful savior vanquishing sin and defeating Satan rather than hanging naked on the cross as sinners at his feet mocked him. And while Christ certainly does triumph over sin, Paul here is asking us to wrestle with the fact that he does it through humility, a virtue that many of us would rather not be called to. This type of humility is beyond anything we could possibly experience, and yet this is the kind of humility that we are called to as Christians. How in the world can we obey this type of exhortation? What would it look like for us to have the mind of Christ and embrace that type of humility? Now, the first thing we need to recognize is that the foundation for this type of humility is not our unworthiness. We are certainly unworthy in relation to God, but that isn't the focus of this passage. I think that's an important thing to mention here because at Wheaton College, we are immersed in an academic environment where our lives are wrapped up with almost constant evaluation. This can make us prone to fears that we aren't good enough, which, perhaps surprisingly, is not actually a good foundation for humility. I want you to think about your first experiences, as we, experiences at Wheaton as a freshman or a transfer student. For some of you, that was just a few weeks ago, um, so the memory should be pretty fresh. For the rest of you, try to think back to your first conversations with other students or to your first experiences in class. Did any of you experience a sense of insecurity about being here? Perhaps a fear that you didn't quite measure up? Many people, when faced with a new experience in a new environment, suffer from insecurity. Fears that while everyone else seems to be adjusting just fine, they are perpetually in danger of being exposed as a fraud. As someone who simply isn't as good as everyone else, but has managed to hide that fact so far. And this is particularly true in academic environments, where we are continually asked to demonstrate our knowledge and skills in front of others. I vividly remember a time in college when I dropped by a professor's office to talk about a paper. As we chatted, he mentioned that he was working on his own paper that he would be delivering at a conference that next week. It wasn't going as well as he would have liked, and with a sheepish smile, he confessed, this might be the time that I am finally revealed as a fraud. That struck me powerfully because it was the first time that I had heard someone that I admired and respected express the feeling of insecurity that I had frequently experienced. Was he a fraud? No. He was simply experiencing the same feeling that I had when I was a sophomore in a literary theory class populated entirely by seniors. Or when I went to my first conference in England 
and suddenly realized how odd it was to have me, a Puerto Rican graduate student, speaking to an audience of senior British scholars. Or when I got my job here at Wheaton College and looked around at all of my stellar colleagues. Throughout our lives, we are presented with experiences that may compel us to wonder, am I smart enough? Am I spiritual enough? Am I good enough? Now, you might think that these insecurities would lead nicely to a sense of humility, but it really doesn't work that way. For we tend to respond to them in one of two problematic ways. Either we overcompensate and try to convince everyone how worthy we actually are, or we shrink into ourselves and begin to doubt our worth. Either way, the focus is on our feelings of unworthiness, which denies the fact that we are all unique individuals created by God to be in relationship with him and work to help further his kingdom. It's therefore important to realize that the humility described in this passage is made possible not because of our unworthiness, but because of love. First and foremost, God's love for us. As we think about the call to take on the mindset of Christ, we must recognize that while humility was certainly the manifestation of this mindset, the motivation for Christ coming to earth, taking on the form of a bondservant, and dying on the cross was love. Paul places this exhortation about humility within the context of Christ's supremely loving act of salvation. And he emphasizes that with a number of propositions at the beginning of chapter two. If there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, if we have these things, which of course we do, this type of humility becomes possible for they allow us to rest confidently in God's love for us. We can't be outed as a fraud to God. He knows us better than we know ourselves, so we can never surprise him with some deep, dark, secret insecurity that no one else knows. He knows the complete truth about us and loves us, and that love isn't contingent. We don't need to prove our worth to God, though we are granted the chance to serve him and to grow as his disciples. And we certainly aren't in competition with other Christians for God's love or favor. None of this is new information, of course, but we need to call ourselves back to it every time we start to feel like a fraud or get jealous of the blessings that others have or feel the need to strive to be seen or heard. God sees us, knows us, loves us, and cares for us. Does this mean that our lives will always go perfectly? No. We will, of course, experience trials and tribulations, but even in the midst of them, we can rest securely in God's love, and we need to remember that truth. Think about how often in Scripture we encounter the story of God rescuing the Israelites from their slavery in Egypt. Why is it mentioned so often? Why is it commemorated every year with Passover? Because it serves as a powerful reminder of God's love and deliverance. What are those reminders in your own life? What moments can you point to when you can clearly see God's love and care? I have several that I regularly draw on. There's a time when I was debating where to go to college and I felt God calming my heart through the serenity of nature. Or there was the time I was struggling to decide between two job offers and God clearly spoke to me through scripture. These are moments that I regularly return to in my mind to remind me of how God has revealed his love in very personal ways to me throughout my life. Accepting the vulnerability of humility is easier when we're able to rest in the foundation of God's love. So it helps to have a few examples in our own lives to draw on as a reminder of his love when we start to feel vulnerable and begin to worry about whether we are good enough. From this foundation of God's love, we are then called to enact humility within the security of a loving community. Throughout Philippians, Paul emphasizes not only God's love for us, but also the love that should circulate within Christian communities. Paul repeatedly mentions his love for the Philippians and their love for him. In chapter one, verses three and four, he declares, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the very first day until now. The Philippians have faithfully supported Paul in his ministry and are, as he calls them in chapter two, verse 12, his beloved. And it is within this overall context of love that he challenges the Philippians to take that love to an even deeper level. 
He asked them in chapter two, verse two, to fulfill his joy by being like-minded, <clears throat> having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And it is from this foundation that he continues in verses three and four to focus on humility. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. The focus here is not on the idea that our unworthiness should make us humble. Instead, Paul focuses on the fact that humility can be a powerful way for us to demonstrate love to others and for them to demonstrate love to us. This type of humility within community shouldn't leave individuals vulnerable, for if everyone is truly united in love, we'll be able to see who needs help and support at different times. As we are esteeming others, others are also esteeming us. And importantly, this type of esteem may manifest itself in different ways. Sometimes we may need, we may need to step up, take charge, and help others. But at other times, we may need to step back and encourage others to use their gifts. To do this well, it takes sensitivity to others as we learn what it would look like to truly esteem them, and as they learn what it would look like to truly esteem us. The goal here, however, is not simply the health of the people within the community as they learn to love each other well. The humility that supports this love has a much wider purpose. It is the means of, first, empowering each individual member of the community to do the work he or she is called to do for the gospel, and second, ensuring that these various individual works come together in unity for this common purpose. Now, the community of Christians in Philippi was very diverse. There were Jews and Gentiles, successful Roman citizens, and slaves. It would have been very easy for the fabric of this community to fray. With so many different backgrounds, they certainly must have had different ideas about how to move forward as a church. There probably were a few tensions, since Paul warns them that they must not be divided by selfish ambition and conceit. While the Philippians have a strong mutual goal of working to spread the gospel, Paul recognizes that in order for that to be done well, they must learn to esteem each other, esteem others better than themselves. They must begin to understand that while each has a part to play in the work of the gospel, each individual work is not the only nor even the most important part. They must learn to recognize the value of others' work and the importance of encouraging everyone to participate in what they have been called to do. And this is why humility, this project of learning to esteem others better than ourselves, is so important. It allows us as the body of Christ to spread the gospel effectively as we come together in unity. One of the best discussions I have found of this type of productive community comes from the writing of Dorothy L. Sayers, one of the writers we have here at the Wade Center. When Sayers shifted from her career as a writer of detective fiction and began to write for the theater, she knew that she had much to learn. She relied heavily on theater professionals to help her hone her craft. Her letters to them are full of requests for help as she sought to master this new medium, and she was remarkably humble regarding her place within this new community. She fully recognized that her script was only one component in the success of the final production. In fact, in a poem dedicated to one of her directors, she describes her play as dull, deaf, senseless ink and paper until it receives life through an actual production. In order for her play to be successful, Sayers knew that she needed a strong team to bring it to life. Everyone, writer, cast and crew needed to be committed not only to doing their own excellent work individually, but also to supporting the rest of the community with their, experience, with their expertise. Only with that kind of focus, passion, and humility would the final goal of a successful play be achieved. The powerful significance of this for Sayers is revealed in a talk that she delivered in 1941, when she was invited to speak on the church's witness in society. When thinking about the powerful unifying bond that should exist among Christians, she was struck by the fact that she had found this not in the church, but in theater. She remarks, I know that if their stomachs are aching, their parents dying, their wives deserting them, and the whole company quarreling like cats, a rigid discipline will find them at their posts when the curtain rises. That they are conscious of a tremendous traditional solidarity 
of a rooted loyalty to something outside themselves, which is expressed in the threadbare formula, the show must go on, which not only makes toil and fatigue and hardship and difficulty negligible, but transforms them into a kind of arduous pleasure. And because of these things, I recognize in the theater all the stigmata of a real and living church. For Sayers, theater provides a wonderful example of what the church should be, a group of diverse individuals who, despite their differences, are able to humbly support each other in their jobs as they work together toward their common goal of living out the gospel. This is precisely what Paul is calling the Philippians to do. He doesn't want their work for the gospel to be undermined by division, so he calls them to practice the humility that will help them accomplish their goal. In addition, Paul recognizes that the unity that comes from this type of mutual humility can in itself be a powerful witness to the truth of the gospel. He explains this later in chapter two. In verses 15 and 16, he declares his hope that they may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom they shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. Paul saw the Philippians' humility as a powerful part of the work of the gospel, for it would allow them to tangibly reveal the redemptive power of Christ that could bring together this diverse group of people in unity as they worked to share in the truth of the gospel and to love and support each other within this task. Now, here's the interesting thing about humility. It isn't something that we can add to our to-do list. Study for bio, write my anthro paper, become more humble. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. Remember, it actually begins by letting go and resting in God's love and care. For as Paul tells us in chapter two, verse 13, it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. But Paul also reminds us in Philippians three of the importance of pressing on and reaching forward to what God has called us to do. With this foundation of God's all-consuming love, we are then empowered to demonstrate that love to others through humility. But in order to do that, we need to be consciously cultivating community with the people around us, getting to know people at deep levels so that we are able to esteem them well and they are able to esteem us well. But we also need to move beyond our immediate community. For ultimately, we are called to be in unity, not only with our small group of friends, or our local church congregation, but also with the wider body of Christ across the globe. A challenging task, but one that you can already begin to prepare for. College gives you a unique opportunity to engage deeply with a variety of people, an opportunity that you may never have again. So think about ways that you can broaden your community and develop your skills of esteeming others who may not be exactly like you. Where might you need to learn the humility of listening and learning from those who are different from you? Where might you need to step up and voice an opinion that is missing from the conversation so that someone else might learn from it? Where might you need to confront those who aren't esteeming others well? Now is the perfect time to practice the skills that will enable all of us to become the type of church that Paul envisioned. In today's society, humility tends to be associated with feelings like inadequacy or unworthiness, qualities that hold us back and keep us from achieving great things, qualities that, in effect, make us miserable. In Philippians, Paul associates humility with joy. In four short chapters, Paul uses some form of the word joy 16 times. Now, this isn't because he and the Philippians are in particularly good circumstances. Paul is in prison and the Philippian Christians are being persecuted. Their joy comes not from their circumstances, but rather from the assurances that make the virtue of humility possible. Trust in God's work of salvation and his all-consuming love for us, hope in a strong community united in their desire to spread the gospel and committed to esteeming each other well, and finally, faith that God will work powerfully through this community as it shines as a light in the world. Embracing humility with joy. It might be one of the most countercultural things we can do in our world today. If we try to do it alone, it's a scary prospect. But when we root ourselves in God's love for us and join with others in strong community, we have the assurance 
that this will be humility with a purpose. Humility that enables all of us as the body of Christ to do the work that God has called us to do. Thank you.